This Rabbi Yaakov Wolby podcast is sponsored by Fabuloso Household Care Rabbi Cleaner. Pastor, Fill I your home with joy. No ads on my podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Tyson's Face Tats. No Have ads. you ever wanted to look like. No sponsorships. Average Rabbi, please. Bill and Anthony's Daily Multivax. Order your six month supply Rabbi with Pastor, promo code TORCH for 10% average off. Average Rabbi. No ads. No sponsorships. No promo codes. But this is how we make money. This is not how we make money. This is not how we make money. I, I will not subject. My podcast listeners, the listeners that I love, the listeners that want to come hear Torah and hear words of wisdom and learn about their heritage and learn about Jewish history and learn about Jewish values and connect themselves with the Almighty and connect themselves with His Torah and deepen their bond with their soul. I'm not going to have readouts. Rabbi Basto, my dear colleague, I'm not going to do it. Rabbi, well, we have bills to pay. Uh, so what's the other option? Is there anything else we could do? We need help. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we, maybe we do something else. You see, most podcasts, they have to pay their bills and they have ads and they have readouts and they have promo codes and they have Dollar Shave Club and Geico and mattresses. I don't want to sell you mattresses. I want to give you what you come for. I want to give you Torah. I want to give you wisdom from the Almighty. I want to give you a connection with our glorious religion and glorious heritage. But we need to pay our bills. So what we do is that we don't do any ads. No ads. No, no matter how much the average rabbi, my colleague, Rabbi Busto, insists on doing the ads, insists on doing these promo codes, none of that. We do an annual fundraiser, and that's happening right now. And the website for that is givetorch.org. Give, the word give, to give. Give your heart. Give your soul. Give a little boost, a little bit of love to Torch. Give Torch.org. It's happening right now. Every donation is doubled. This is our only annual fundraiser. We do this once a year. Until next year, you're not going to hear about this. It's happening now. If, you, if you're hearing this right now, you should know that it's still active. Every donation is doubled. And yes, Robert Busco, he's insistent. He's insistent. Are you insistent? Well, if there's a better a little solution. Bit. I do like the multivax. <laughs> yeah, okay. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll, maybe we'll make a little exception for that. But no ads. That, that's the plan. We've done now podcasts since 2012, 12 years, and we're committed to this. We're committed to connecting Jews and Judaism locally in Houston and globally throughout our podcast and the many other digital offerings that we have here at Torch. We do one fundraiser a year and we want your support. Visit givetorch.org. Right now, press pause on the podcast. Press pause. Stop the podcast. GiveTorch.org. Make a donation. And then, you know, for the rest of the year, you are partnering with us. We're not going to bombard you with ads. We're not going to bombard you with fundraising emails every day, every week, every month. Once a year, we try to get everyone to give, everyone to contribute. If you appreciate our work, if you enjoy our work, if you want to support our work, if you want to support the great rabbis here at the Torch Center, Rabbi Busto, the average rabbi, and everyone else that's over here, and all the incredible work that we do here from the Torch Center Houston, Texas, visit givetorch.org right now and make a donation. Show us some love. We're not gonna, we're not gonna drive you crazy. Make the donation. Of course, my email address is rabbiwolbajima.com and that website again, givetorch.org. We began our exploration of the mysterious subject of resurrection. The dead will come back alive. This is the 13th principle of the 13 principles of faith as codified by Rambam. And we learn that the dead will live once again. And last time we mentioned how it's a very foreign concept for us. And it's one that we need to get more accustomed to. And last time we poked around a little bit and we spoke about maybe some ways to think about it. We spoke about how sleep, you know, go to sleep at night and your soul departs to a certain extent. The Talmud says that sleep is a 60th of death. And then in the morning, if sleep is a 60th of death, well, then maybe waking up in the morning is a 60th of resurrection. And that's maybe one way to think about it. And then we spoke about another way to think about resurrection, and that was the context of the precedent for resurrection. There were some prophets, as documented in Scripture, who were able to revive the dead. Elijah, Elisha, 
Ezekiel, well, it exists in our history, in our scripture, and maybe a version of that is what we are talking about in this principle. And then we mentioned that there's going to be a resurrection in the times of Messiah, and there is a second resurrection, and that is more associated with Olam Abba, with the world to come. And we spoke last time about how the Mishnah stresses that it's not sufficient to simply believe in resurrection. You have to believe that resurrection is sourced in the Torah. And the Talmud brings many verses to this effect. And we also spoke last time of the various debates and discussions that are recorded in the Talmud between the great sages and Roman nobility about resurrection. We don't find this with other principles, and that's noteworthy. We talked about how, you know, Cleopatra went over to Rabbi Meir and says, well, when the, when the dead emerge, will they be naked? Will they be clothed? I mean, a second recorded dialogue between the great sage and Caesar. Caesar is questioning the notion of resurrection. How could it be? When people die, their bodies die, they're put into the ground, they turn into dust. Can dust live? And to that, Caesar's daughter responded, I'll give an answer. She provides an analogy of the two craftsmen in a given city, the two contractors, the two builders. One is able to construct out of mortar and one out of water. Which one's more impressive? Of course, if you can build out of water, that's much more impressive. Well, today, God forms humans out of fluid, out of water, out of the biological matter that makes humans. That, objectively, is harder than taking dust and fashioning them into humans. This is what we covered last time. We tried to survey the general landscape. As we mentioned, there's not a ton of sources, and it's very mysterious. And it's almost as if it's designed to be unclear. The sources are opaque, and they don't spell it out in an organized fashion. We have to work really hard to try to plumb the depths of what our sages are telling us. And that's what I want to do today. Today, I want to probe the subject a bit deeper and to try to get to the heart of the matter. Before we unpack the specific details, the application layer of resurrection, I want to try to get to the essence of this principle, and then we will proceed outwardly from there. Today, we're going to try to address this idea, this principle, the essence, the heart of this matter from a few different angles. So let's begin. Many of the commentators are puzzled by this principle. Rambam is organizing the framework of our religion into 13 distinct principles. If you have these 13, you have this religion. If you want to be ideologically a Jew, you have to understand, know, and believe these 13 principles. And each one's necessary, and each one is independent of the others. Many of Rambam's contemporaries are puzzled by this one, resurrection. Why does this need to be a standalone principle? We know, we learned, we read that resurrection exists at some point, in some capacity, in messianic times. So why can't this just be a detail in principle number 12, the principle of Messiah? We also learned that there's another kind of resurrection that is more associated with Olam Abba. Well, maybe that could be a detail in principle number 11, the idea of eternal reward and punishment. So what's the unique principle being conveyed over here? That's what I want to address today. It turns out there is something unique and very different about this principle that differentiates it from all other 12. So as we mentioned, the Mishnah stresses, it tells us all of Israel is a portion of the world to come. 
And these are the exceptions. And the first exception is Haomer Ein Trizamesimana Torah. Someone who says that there is no resurrection from the Torah. In the preceding 12 principles, which are all equally fundamental, you need all 13. In the preceding 12, we don't have this stipulation. We don't have this addendum that you have to believe it from the Torah. It doesn't say you have to believe in Messiah from the Torah. You have to believe in Olam Abba from the, from the Torah. You have to believe about, about God, God being one, God being not corporeal from the Torah. This is not an incidental aspect of this principle. It's quite central to it, as we shall see. The principle itself, it's not just a belief in the concept of resurrection. You have to believe in the resurrection from the Torah. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean, resurrection from the Torah? And why do none of the preceding 12 principles have this stipulation? Here's the D point. Resurrection, this principle, principle number 13, is supernatural. It is not something that can be explained, experienced, understood from any of the the, the natural systems that we are familiar with. You cannot use your logic and your understanding of nature and the principles of physics to understand it. And this is the only one of the 12, of the 13, meaning in contrast to the preceding 12. It's the only one that you cannot arrive at it via some sort of experiential or logical deduction. Resurrection is from the Torah. It's supernatural. The preceding 12 principles can be derived from logic. It might be hard. You might have to think a lot. But a pondering, thinking, truth-seeking person can arrive at a certain realization that these principles are all true. God exists, and he, and he precedes all, and God is singular and all-powerful and omniscient and not corporeal and worthy of our prayer, and he communicates with us the concept of prophecy, and he gave us a Torah. He told us how to live. And that was done via the father of all prophets, and the Torah doesn't change, and there is reward and punishment, and there is Messiah, there is this idea of the world coming to its perfection. Theoretically, the preceding 12 principles, you don't need the Torah to arrive at. The 13th, resurrection. It demands that we believe resurrection from the Torah because the only way to arrive at it is via the Torah. There is no experiential, there's no logical way to substantiate this belief other than it being from the Torah. Now, Ramam himself, in his primary works, gives very, very little detail to this principle. But he also wrote another work, called Igeres Triasamesim, the, the epistle, the letter of resurrection. In it, he fleshes out more of his understanding of this principle. And he very clearly differentiates between all the other principles and this one. This one is a mo-face. It's a wonder. It's something supernatural. And it's something that exists outside of the parameters of natural reality. And there's no proof to it from logic. When we are talking about this principle, the essence of the matter is that it's resurrection from the Torah and not from any other source because it is supernatural. It's not something which can be explained or understood in the framework. From the vantage point, in the paradigm 
of natural reality, and even our logic cannot perceive it and understand it. And, and really there's more. Not only does logic and experience not prove the resurrection, resurrection actually violates the rules of nature. The rules of nature tell us that things go from living to dead. That is the progression. There's a certain entropy where things break down. Anything that's comprised of different components must eventually have those components come apart. The body and soul, the hybrid, those two must separate. The soul must go back to its source, the body to its, the soul to heaven, the body to the dust from which it was formed. As the verse tells us, man is dust, and to dust he shall return. So the rules of nature are in one direction, from living to dying. And thus, not only is resurrection not supported, so to speak, by the rules of nature, by logic, they are in opposition. And we see the sages engage with various Roman aristocrats in polemical debates, and they are making very good, sound arguments. They're saying, wait a minute, resurrection, the dead come alive, that violates the, the rules of the world. And you know what? They're right. If the governing rules of the world, if nature, if that is applied universally at all times, even in the future, they're right. Resurrection is, in fact, infeasible. And we're not coming on logical grounds. We're saying resurrection comes from the Torah. It comes from a realm that is not subject to the rules of nature. And in fact, it's coming from the realm that dictates the rules of nature and can alter rules of nature at will. Last time we cited Rashi's comment to the Mishnah, when the Mishnah says the person who loses Olam Abba is one who says there's no resurrection from the Torah, Rashi adds, even if a person admits and believes that there is a resurrection, but argues that it's not found in the Torah, Koferhu, this person is a heretic. And they're uprooting the principle of resurrection from the Torah. And we don't care about their faith. Their faith is valueless. The only source for resurrection is from the Torah, from the supernatural realms. And again, there's a very deep point over here. We cited a famous teaching of the sages in the past. Istakel be'oraisa ubara alma. God peered into the Torah and created the world. Torah is a creation of God, but it's a very early and very high creation of God. And thus, it's, it's the most similar to God. Because as the creations go further and further away, it's more distant from God. Of course, all creations are completely subject and beholden to the Creator. But as things get further and further away, the light, so to speak, using Kabbalistic lingo, the light takes more and more stops, so to speak, along the way as it filters down and the association is more distant. There's an association between the creation and the creator. Torah is a very early and high creation of God. And thus, to a certain extent, God and his Torah are one. It's very hard for us to discern any difference between God and his Torah. Now, the world is also the handiwork of God. But it's a lower creation than Torah. And thus, the godly light has to filter through the Torah 
in order to arrive to the world. And God used the Torah, in the words of our sages, to create the world. And thus, Torah, we can say, Torah is the blueprint for the world. There will be nothing that you find in this world that you will not find in the Torah. Just as they say, this a rule in architecture. If it ain't in the blueprint, it won't be in the building. If it's not in the Torah, you won't find it in the world. However, the reverse is not true. If you don't find it in the world, there's no proof that you won't find it in the Torah. If it's not a building, it could still be in the blueprint. Maybe it wasn't built yet. Maybe it's waiting for a future time for that part of the building, for that part of the blueprint to be implemented. There's nothing that precludes something from, yes, being in the blueprint and not being in the building. Resurrection is in the Torah. It's not in this world yet, but it is in the Torah. And with the right time for it to be implemented, even in this world, it will be done. And therefore, if you scour the entire world, and you fundamentally understand all the rules of the world, and all the logic, and all the limitations, and all the stricta of the world, you will not find resurrection. The world as it currently exists, with its current rules and limitations, resurrection is not present. Not only that, the system opposes it. It is against the nature of the world as it currently stands. But how does nature work? How was nature created? Who dictated the limitations of nature? What is the governing rules of nature? That you can find in the Torah. God used the Torah to create nature. Torah is a higher creation than the world. And thus, if you find resurrection in the Torah, it doesn't matter that you don't find it in this world because the Torah is not subject to the rules of this world, to the rules of nature. The opposite is true. And when the time that the Almighty decides to pull the trigger, so to speak, a new reality, a new law of nature will emerge the dead will come alive. And it's a very subtle point, a very deep point. And this is the essence of this principle. In the aforementioned epistle of resurrection, Rambam speaks about this specific point. The Almighty will revive the dead when he wants and to whom he wants. And what will that be? Will that be in the times of Messiah? Will it be beforehand? Will it be after the death of the King Messiah? It doesn't matter. That's not the point. That's the details. God will alter the way this world is governed and will resurrect whomever he wants, whenever he wants, it could be before Messiah. It could be during Messiah. It could be afterwards. The details of resurrection are being de-emphasized here. And what Rambam is trying to get across is to really appreciate the essence of it. And the essence of it is that it comes from the Torah. It's from a higher realm. And when God will choose to change the rules of the world, he will alter the existing rules and the rule of entropy will go away, and the rule of only one direction, living to de- to dying, will be annulled, and the dead will come back alive. What will that be? Whenever God decides. To whom will that be? To whomever God decides. But the heart of the matter is that God is not subject to the rules of nature and of physics. Quite the contrary. He controls them. He controls them via his Torah. And he can, and he will, alter them whenever and to whomever he so chooses. 
Now, to help bring this idea a bit closer to our understanding, I want to give an example of this idea. And again, it's another very subtle point. Adam and Eve committed a sin in the garden. And God told him, on the day that you eat it, you will surely die. And indeed, on the day that Adam ate it, he was condemned to die. The way the world would have worked, or worked prior to that, was that man was designed to live forever. Why should man die? What's wrong with man continuously living? That was the plan, but the sin changed it. The sin altered the nature of the world. And thenceforth, man has to die. The governing rules of the world changed with that sin. And you know what? Resurrection. Resurrection from the Torah. That is when the governing rules of the world will change yet again. And yes, if you look at the world today as it currently stands, the living die and the dead don't come back alive. They remain remain dead. When God decides to change the rules of the world, the dead will come alive. Whomever God wants, whenever God wants, resurrection is from the Torah. It is not subject to the rules, to the limitations of this world as it currently exists. That's the essence of resurrection. Now, to approach this from a different angle, in the Amidah prayer, the Shemur Esrei, you'll find a bunch of references to the resurrection in the second blessing of the Amidah prayer. Now, the, the name, every blessing of the 18 blessings, and then a 19th one was added, every blessing has a, a title, a name. And this blessing is called Givuros, the might of God. And the blessing states, Atadibor, you are mighty. You are forever eternally mighty, God. Mechaye mesim, you give life to the dead. And then there's an interjection about rain. In the summer, you talk about the dew. In the winter, you talk about the wind and the rain. And then the prayer continues. God sustains life with kindness. God revives the dead with great mercy. God supports those who are falling. God heals those who are sick. God releases the bound. God fulfills his faith to those who are sleeping in the dust. Who is like you, one capable of mighty feats? Who is similar to you, a king who kills, makes people die, and brings them back alive, and sprouts redemption? And again, we have, Manata, you are trustworthy to revive the dead. Blessed are you, Hashem the reviver of the dead. For those who are counting, it mentions resurrection five times and maybe six times because it says he fulfills his trust or his faith in those who are sleeping in the dust, which implies they're sleeping in the dust, but they're going to wake up from the dust in resurrection. So maybe it's six times. But in this same blessing, it talks about rain. It talks about sustenance. It emphasizes that this is related to faith. And again, this is in every single Amidah prayer, three times a day, four times on Shabbos and festivals, five times on Yom Kippur. Every single prayer that we do has this entire blessing that's mostly dedicated to the resurrection. And in it, we talk about rain and sustenance 
and it's manifested as a matter of emuna, of faith, and it's called the might of God. And it's not clear what this blessing is really about. And the commentaries all tell us, they all, all universally agree that these blessings are about God's might. This is about the things that are in the hands of God to the exclusion of anyone else. And the commentaries cite the Talmud. The Talmud says that there are three keys that are only in the hands of God, and he never gave them to anyone else. And they are the key of rain and the key of life, of babies being born, and the key of resurrection. And it quotes verses for each one of these, where the verses that God opens up, these portals, the portal of, of rain and sustenance, the portal of life, of procreation, and the portal of resurrection. God will open up, so to speak, will unlock our graves. These things are controlled by God, and they're not controlled by anything else. Meaning, they're not under the realm of this world. The keys to running it are still in a higher realm. And you'll notice that in a lot of the discussions about resurrection in the Talmud, there are comparisons between resurrection and the rain cycle and the planting cycle and the agricultural cycle and resurrection and babies being born. And in every one of the arguments, the sages are addressing the fact that, or, or the, the, the opponents to the sages are addressing the fact that these are not, that resurrection is not something which is existing in our world. The Caesar tells Rabbi Gamaliel, the dead, they're dust. Dust does not come back alive. Resurrection is illogical. And he's right. And that's not the point of our disagreement. The point of our disagreement is not that, oh, you say it's illogical, and I say it is logical. No. On that, everyone agrees. But we believe in resurrection from the Torah. We believe that resurrection is an, is an example of God's might. We believe that this is an article of faith because it's not something which is provable from this world. Torah is not subject to the rules of nature. And if the Torah, if God decrees that resurrection will happen to whomever, whenever God desires, then the rules of the world will change. So the essence of the argument is how fixed are the rules of the world? How fixed are the rules of nature? How unchangeable are the laws of physics? The Torah, that's the blueprint for the world. If it contains the capacity for a new system, a system of resurrection, that means that the rules of the world can change to accommodate that. That's the essence of the disagreement. But that's not what the sages responded to the Roman aristocracy. What does the daughter of Caesar respond to her father? She gives him an analogy. She's accepting his framing and says, well, think about it this way. If we have two Builders in a city, one builds out of water, one builds out, builds out of mortar. Which one is more impressive? Well, the one who builds out of water. Well, if God now builds out of water, why can he build out of dust? What this is telling us is that even though we believe that resurrection comes from the Torah, it's from a higher realm, there can still be analogs, and there can still be parallels to that in this world. 
There are other themes that come from realms that are illogical. There are other things that the keys are in the hands of God. And the manifestations of that is a manifestation of God's might in the world. And the entire subject is, is one of faith because we cannot explain it logically. But those, th- those things, even though they're illogical, some of them undeniably exist in the world. It is true that dust coming alive is no more miraculous, it's less miraculous, in fact, than water, than fluids coming alive. And yet, it's undeniable that we see that happening every day. Yes, resurrection is illogical, but so is fluids coming alive, so are babies. And that's what he's responding There are keys that are in the hands of God that we have not seen. There are keys that are in the hands of God that are not logical that we have seen. And therefore, if we can appreciate that illogical things happen in our world, it must be that there's a system for illogical things to happen, and that is an analog to the resurrection. Now, the Talmud elsewhere gives another example to this point. And I know this is a little bit of a subtle idea, but this is the essence of the matter. And we're coming at it from a few different angles. The Talmud cites a verse in Proverbs. Mishle, chapter 30, verse 16. The verse compares two things which are very, very different from each other. The verse says that the grave and the narrow part of the womb cannot be satiated with water. Now, what this verse means, like many verses in Proverbs, it's a mystery. It's a riddle. But the Talmud says, wait a minute. The verse starts off with Sheol, the grave, and then the Otzer Rechem, the narrow part of the womb, the birth canal. What is the comparison? What could possibly be the overlap between a grave and the narrow part of the womb? The fact that the verse compares them, it must be that there's some sort of similarity. Says the Talmud, here's a similarity. Just as the narrow part of the womb, it takes something in and it sends something out. So too, the grave takes something in and sends something out. The Talmud here is telling us that there's a a parallel between how babies are born and how resurrection happens. Just as the womb takes in something, the ingredients, if you will, for making a baby, and from that same portal, emerges the baby. So too is a grave. It takes in the ingredients for the resurrected person. And now, as of this recording, we're in the gestational periods, if you will. And a baby will emerge from said grave in a way very similar to how babies emerge from the womb. Concludes the Talmud, from here you have a response to those who say there is no resurrection from the Torah. This is an amazing teaching. Death and burial, it's the same thing as the insertion of seed into the womb. It is also interesting, and I mentioned this in my book, that Hebrew does not contain proper names for the reproductive organs. And instead, there are euphemisms employed in the literature. The narrow part of the womb 
is called in the Talmud, in the Mishnah, it's called a prosdar, which means a corridor, which is the same portal, or the same word that the Mishnah used for a portal, connecting this world to the next world. Oh, and the uterus, the actual womb, it's called a kever, which is the same word for a grave. Again, that's not a coincidence. That's another reference to this point that all these keys in the hands of God, these expressions of God's might, these things that we can only believe because they don't make any sense to us, these are parallels to each other and we can deduce and glean and become comfortable with a notion of resurrection by examining other illogical things that happen that are manifestations of God's might, that are examples of God's, so to speak, the areas that he has teased to at play. Now, if you read this Talmud simply, the Talmud concludes that from this verse, the verse in Proverbs, chapter 30, we can refute those who say that there is no resurrection from the Torah. Now, the word Torah strictly means the five books of the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Devarim, Deuteronomy. Proverbs is not in the Torah. It seems like the Talmud says that this is proof that resurrection is, is from the Torah, but it doesn't cite a verse from the Torah. How is this a proof? Again, this, this, this gets to our central point. When the Mishnah says that this principle is someone who questions this principle, someone who says that there is no resurrection from the Torah, it doesn't mean that there's no proof of resurrection of the Torah. It means that as well. But it means that resurrection comes from the realm of Torah, from a supernatural realm. It comes from a world that is above the rules of this world. Now, there's a very famous piece of Rambam where he addresses the flaws, the weaknesses in Aristotle's thinking. He says that Aristotle would, would reject anything that is supernatural. And the Rama brings a, a, a disproof, a refutation of Aristotle with this example. He says, if, if you knew all the rules of the world, all the laws of nature, all the laws of physics. But you never knew how babies came into existence. You never saw a pregnant woman. And someone tried to persuade you that the way babies come into existence is they inhabit the insides of a woman for nine months. And then they come out alive. You would never believe that because it's, it's just not possible. It violates the rules of our world. It's not possible to exist inside another person's body. You would suffocate. It's illogical, yet it is undeniable. And from this one example, we can see something existing in a supernatural way, and this can be ported over and this can help us understand or become comfortable with a general notion of things that are not logical, yet existing because they are a reflection of the keys of God. When Cleopatra asked the great rabbi to explain resurrection and whether or not uh, the ones who emerge, will they be clothed? Will they be naked? He responds with an analogy of, of the wheat. The wheat goes in naked and it emerges with lots of layers of chaff. It is clothed. And certainly the righteous who are buried with clothing, they will emerge with clothing. This is another example of, of what the sages are doing here. They're taking another analog to resurrection, something which is illogical yet undeniable a manifestation of something which exists in our world, but we cannot control it, meaning it's not, it doesn't follow the rules of 
nature, yet it's here, it doesn't make sense to us. There's no way that we can explain how you take a seed and you put it in the ground, you bury it, if you will, and it begins to rot and decompose. It's following the laws of entropy. It's going from living to dying. And you dig it up after a couple of days, and it just got worse. No logic dictates that it should spring to life. And that it should proliferate. And one little seed gives you a whole apple tree with tons of apples. And more seeds for future apple, ap- apple trees. It's not logical. We have no way to explain it. Yet it is undeniable. It's not from our world. God has the keys to it. But we see it in action and we believe in it. And that can help us grow comfortable with ideas being illogical yet true. Yes, they contradict the way the world works currently. But we have faith. We believe. We acknowledge that there's another system, a higher system, and we see parallels to that system in action. And that's our relationship with the resurrection. If someone just believes in it, but doesn't accept that, Rashi says he's a heretic, because that's not the belief. The belief is to believe in resurrection from the Torah. Every act of planting, our sages tell us, is an act of faith. That doesn't mean that you cannot be a heretic, an atheist planter. That means that when someone does something and they cannot explain, there's no logic, there's no rules of this world that can explain how the result, the expected result is going to be what they want, and they do it nonetheless. That's the realm of Amuna. And that's why when we talk about this second blessing of the Amidah, it's all about the faith that we are displaying in all these areas, in, in, in rain and the agricultural cycle and babies being born and in the resurrection. And of course, we saw how Rabbi Meir tells us that the righteous will emerge like, like wheat. They'll be clothed, but in many other places, for example, Ksubos 111b describes the righteous emerging, sprouting out of the ground, and quotes verses to that effect. In Jerusalem, they will surface in a way very similar to plants. We start off by asking a question. Why is resurrection a standalone principle? If it's just, hey, this is a feature of Messiah, this is a feature of Omaba. It's not a feature. It's a standalone principle. And the principle, principally, is about the notion of God being in control in ways that are not explainable by our world. It's about the dominion of God and its complete mastery over the world and its complete control over the world. And in his Torah, he tells us that at some point he will change the rules of the world and he will revive the dead. And Ramam himself tells us this in his aforementioned epistle. He says that someone who repudiates this principle is effectively repudiating the notion of the supernatural, is effectively repudiating the notion that God controls nature and that God gave us the Torah. That's the principle. God exists, has all the power, is not subject to the world. The Torah is not subject to the world. And this world And its rules can be altered by God effortlessly. And this is going to help us as we get into the next phase, if you will, or into some of the next phases of our studies. For example, Rambam, in his writings on this principle, he stresses that resurrection is only for the righteous. And then the full citation that he quotes is that, well, rain is for everyone. 
Resurrection, that's only for the righteous. If you just read that on its face, it would, have, it would make no sense to you. What does rain have to do with resurrection? What he's telling us is that when God deploys this higher level, this supernatural, this illogical way of treating the world, the keys that are in the hands of God to the solution of anyone else, when it comes to rain, that's for everyone. When it comes to resurrection, that's only for the righteous. But it also gives us maybe somewhat of a framework of what we need to do if we want to be righteous and to be eligible for resurrection. How would someone qualify? What do you need to do to become eligible for resurrection? We now see a framework for that. Resurrection is the birth to the burial at death. It's like the that death is the implanting of the seed in the grave slash the womb through the birth canal. And then something will happen. And then the righteous will emerge as a baby does. You cannot plant apple seeds and expect tomatoes to grow. If we understand what life is about after the resurrection, we'll understand what we need to do today to make ourselves into a seed worthy of that life. So this is not just an idea, an eschatological thing to think about. It can be very practical for us in our lives. Because if you're listening to this, you have yet to be planted in the, in the, in the grave, right? And that means you still get to determine what goes into said planting. And that's what will emerge in the future. So if we understand what kind of people the Rama means by, by righteous, they are the ones who will emerge and we could extrapolate from, from that, well, okay, what, what would a seed of that look like? We know what we would need to do to be eligible. And of course, that's that's part of the details that we hope yet to, to cover. Uh, we will try to understand the details of resurrection as best as we can. But the essence of the matter is that resurrection is from the Torah. It's from a higher realm. It's not logical, but there are parallels. There are analogs. There are other things like rain, like agriculture, like having a baby that are not logical, yet are undeniable. And that can help us understand more about how this whole idea, this whole realm of government, of God via his keys, works. Now, again, there's a lot to cover. You know, we wondered last time, why are there so many proofs from the Torah? The Talmud could have brought one proof for resurrection, and that would be sufficient to prove that the resurrection is a principle that's featured in the Torah. And it brings more than a dozen. We spoke last time about how one of them is, is Aaron. He's going to be a recipient of our tithes. And about the forefathers, that they're going to be in the land, and about the, the notion of eternal life. It seems to me that when the Torah is outlining all these different realms or elements or aspects of resur resurrection, each one of them is not just a proof to the notion, to the general notion of, of resurrection, but to what this actually means. What is this illogical thing that we will hopefully one day get to witness? If each one of them tells us a different element, then that is actually revealing not just that this exists in general, but the details and the specifics that we will hope please God to explore. We talked about how part of this principle is going to be featured in the times of the Messiah. Part of it is for Olam Abba. Part of it is about judgment. There is a lot of exciting subjects upcoming and I am looking forward, please God, to studying them with y'all. 
in good health and in great spirits. I hope you enjoy. I know there's a little bit of a subtle message I'm trying to convey today, but I think it is it is part, it, it's what our cities are telling us. Resurrection is from the Torah. It's from that realm that's above the realm of this world. And this, the sages had to encounter the Romans who were making very sound arguments because they were using a different framework. And the rabbis tried to respond by bringing the notion of the illogical yet undeniable to bring it a bit closer to their understanding. Once we understand the principle, now we can move outwardly to see, okay, what are the applications? How does this play out? And hopefully, please God, we will round out our understanding of principle number 13, the idea of resurrection of the dead from the Torah. I'm looking forward to your questions, your comments, and your feedback. My email address is rabbiwalpy at gmail.com.